Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for those kind words of introduction. Lisa Cooper, thank you, and the Leadership Foundation. Mr. Prime Minister, and to each and every one of you, members of the panel, I'm delighted, very happy, and very pleased to be here in Norway. I first came here many, many years ago. I was invited by the Scandinavian Student Association, including students and young people here in this great country. It's good to be back here again. Now, you, some of you probably know I grew up in rural Alabama, 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. My father was a sharecropper, a tenant farmer. I grew up very, very poor with six brothers and three mm -hmm. sisters. Wonderful mother, wonderful father, wonderful grandparents and great-grandparents. Growing up there in rural Alabama, when we would visit the city of Montgomery, visit the little town of Troy, visit Tuskegee or Birmingham, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. As a young child, I tasted the bitter fruits of segregation and racial discrimination, and I didn't like it. On a Saturday afternoon with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins, we would go downtown to the little town of Troy to the theater. And all of us little black children had to go upstairs to the balcony. And all of the little white children went downstairs to the first floor. I would come home and ask my mother, ask my father, why? Why segregation? Why racial discrimination? And they would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. Well, one day in 1955, at the age of 15, I heard about Rosa Parks in Montgomery. I heard the words of Martin Luther King Jr. on the old radio, and I was deeply inspired to find a way to get in the way. So as a young child, when I was only 17 years old, finished high school, I wanted to attend a little college called Troy State College. 10 miles from my home, known now as Troy University. I wrote a letter, got a copy of an application, submitted my application, sent my high school transcript. I never heard a word from the school, not one word. So I wrote a letter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He wrote me back and sent me a round trip Greyhound bus ticket and invited me to come to Montgomery. To make a long story short, I was accepted at another look school in Tennessee, and one of my teachers are told that I've been in contact with Dr. King, this teacher knew Dr. King, informed Dr. King that I was in school in Nashville. Martin Luther King Jr. got back in church with me and suggested when I was home for spring break to come and see him. So in March of 1958, my father drove me to the Greyhound bus station I boarded this Greyhound bus and traveled to 50 miles from Troy to Montgomery and went to a little church called the First Baptist Church in downtown Montgomery, pastored by the Reverend Ralph Abernathy, a colleague of Dr. King. I was so scared, I was so frightened. I didn't know what to say or what to do. I walked through the door of that little office Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Reverend Ralph Abernathy were standing behind the desk. And Dr. King said, oh, are you the boy from Troy? Oh, are you John Lewis? And I said, Dr. King, I am John Robert Lewis. I gave my whole name. And that was the beginning of my relationship with Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement. I continued to study in Nashville. And it was in this city of Nashville where you had Fish University, Tennessee State University, Meharry Medical College, Vanderbilt University, Peabody College. And it was there that we started studying the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolence. It was there that a group of black and white students came together 
students from Africa and other parts of the world came together. And we have what we call test sit-in. Be sitting there in, at a lunch counter in a restaurant waiting to be served. And someone would come up and spit on us. Or put a lighted cigarette out in our hair or down our backs. Pour hot water on us. We kept sitting in day in and day out waiting to be served. And finally, the first mass arrest in the city movement occurred on February 27, 1960. My folks had told me not to get in trouble, but I got in trouble. It was necessary trouble. It was good trouble to help end segregation and racial discrimination in the American South. When I was arrested and went to jail the very first time, I felt free, I felt liberated. I felt like, yes, I'm part of an effort, part of a struggle to do what Dr. King called, redeem the soul of America. And just think a few short years ago, 50 years ago, the same year that Barack Obama was born, the same year that President Barack Obama was born, black people and white people, students, adults, couldn't be seated together on a Greyhound bus, or a trailway bus, couldn't be seated together on a train, leaving Washington, D.C., and traveling through Virginia, through North Carolina, South Carolina, through Georgia, through Alabama, through Mississippi, on the way to New Orleans without the possibility of being arrested or jailed and, or beaten. And that's what happened to many of us. I had a white seatmate. We were seated together on a bus, and we arrived in a little town called Rock Hill, South Carolina, a short distance from Charlotte, North Carolina. And the moment we started through the door of this waiting room, Mark, white waiting, a group of young white men jumped us, beat us, and left us lying bloody in the doorway of the bus station. But one of the same individuals that beat me and my seatmate and left us lying there bloody came to see me in February of 2009 and said, I want to apologize for what I did. It's a story crying. He gave me a hug. He asked me to accept his apology, and I said yes. I hugged him back, and I started crying. The movement in America was about reconciliation. We were not struggling against people, but we were struggling to end bad customs, tradition. We were seeking justice. Just think. 46 years ago, a year, before I came here, people were beaten on the bridge in Selma, Alabama, just trying to register to vote people who have been denied the right to vote simply because of the color of their skin. In part of the American South, back in 1960, not up into 1965, but during the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, people could not register to vote. They had to pass a so-called literacy test. In certain section of the Constitution of Alabama, or Georgia, or Mississippi, or the U.S. Constitution. Pay a poll tax, people stood on unmovable lines. On one occasion in Alabama, a black man was asked to count the number of bubbles in a bar, a bar of soap. How many smart scholars, scientists, students can count the number of bubbles in a bar of soap? But to count the number of jelly beans in a jar, there were black lawyers, doctors, ministers, college professors flunking the so-called literacy test. We didn't give up, we didn't give in. We didn't become bitter or hostile. We kept the faith. Our movement was a movement of people moving together to create that sense of community, that sense of one family, that sense of one house. We were saying that we are one people. We're one community. We're one family. We're not just part of the American house, but part of the world house. 
I tell a story from time to time, and I will be finished. And during the 60s, I got arrested a few times, 40 times. Left bloody and unconscious at the Greyhound bus station in Montgomery, also in May of 1961. Had a concussion on the bridge in Selma, marching for the right to vote. But I didn't become bitter or hostile. I'm very hopeful and very optimistic about the future in America and the future of our world. When I was growing up, and I hope you understand this little story that I probably shouldn't be telling, but I try to tell it uh, maybe in a way that it will be universal. But when, when I was growing up, I had an aunt by the name of Seneva, and my aunt Seneva lived in what we call a shotgun house. I know here in Norway, here in Oslo, you don't have what you would call a shotgun house. I know what a shotgun house is because I was born in it. Uh, my aunt Geneva didn't have a green manicured lawn, had a simple plain dirt yard. And at night sometime you can look up through the holes in the house, through the holes in the tin ceiling, and you can count the stars. When it would rain, she would get a pail, a bucket, or a tub and catch the rainwater. From time to time, she would walk out into the woods and cut branches from a dogwood tree and tie these branches together and make a broom. And she called that broom the breast broom. And she would sweep this dirt yard clean, especially on the re weekend, especially on a Friday or Saturday, because she wanted the dirt yard to look very good during the weekend. Now, in a nonviolent sense, a shotgun house, old house, one way in, one way out, but you can bounce a basketball through the front door and it will go straight out the back door. But one Saturday afternoon, a group of my brothers and sisters and a few of my first cousins, I planned in my Ernst and Eva dirt yard and an unbelievable storm came up. The wind started blowing, the thunder started rolling, the lightning started flashing and the rain started beating on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. My aunt became terrified. She started crying. She got all of us little children together and told us to hold hands. The wind continued to blow, the thunder continued to roll, the lightning continued to flash, and the rain continued to beat on the tin roof of this old shotgun house. And we cried and we cried. And when one corner of this old house appeared to be lifting from its foundation, my aunt had us to walk to that corner to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. When the other corner appeared to be lifting, she had us to walk to that side to try to hold the house down with our little bodies. We were little children walking with the wind, but we never left the house. It doesn't matter whether we live here in Norway or we live in New York, in Somalia, in the Middle East, wherever we live, we're one people, we're one family. We all live in the same house, the world house. So we must never ever lose faith. We must never ever give up. If someone had told me when I would have been beaten, arrested, and going to jail, that one day I would live to see the unbelievable changes have, that have occurred in America, I would say, you don't know what you're talking about. But with the spirit and the philosophy and the discipline of nonviolent, you must always have that sense of hope and optimism. And you never ever give up or give in or get lost in a sea of despair. You have to keep moving, keep pushing to redeem not just the soul of a nation, of a city, but the soul of the world. I happen to believe in nonviolence as a way of life, as a way of living. It's one of those immutable principles. You come to the point where you respect the dignity and the worth of every human being. So people who suppress us, beat us down, 
We cannot hate. The way of love, the way of peace, the way of nonviolence is a better way. Thank you very much.